Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're delighted to see you here in the house of God today at Northside. We welcome every one of you. We welcome our visitors visiting with us today. We're just glad to have you. May the good Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. So if you call someone and have them to tune in, we'll try to be a blessing to everyone possible. So now at this time we'll turn the service over to Paul and he'll direct the song service. And what he has lined up for us, I'm sure, will be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul, at this time. Get your hymnal, turn to page 372. Today, take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 15 for the reading of God's Word. It's page 1067 in my Bible. Page 1067. I'm going to speak to you today on this line of thought. The man who was sentenced to die, but another took his place. In Mark chapter 15, beginning with verse 7. Page 1067 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. While you're turning there, let me say to the radio listening audience, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune in each day to this station where you're now listening, at 12 o'clock noon, you can get the daily broadcast. Last week and this coming week, we bring in a series of messages on the judgment seat of Christ, on rewards and crowns and so forth. And we're sending out a little leaflet that tells you about the rewards and crowns that God's people receive. And we'll be glad to send you this pamphlet at your request. But when you write, remember this is a faith ministry. 
Now I look to you to love God to help me keep the program on the air. So you write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. You remember me in prayer and let me hear from you and I appreciate it. Now beginning with verse 7 of Mark chapter 15. Now there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I should release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people, that he would rather release Barabbas unto them, and Pilate answered and said again unto them, What are ye then that I shall do unto him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. So Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Now that's reading from Mark chapter 15 verses 7 through 15. And I want to speak to you about this man Barabbas who was sentenced to die but another man died in his place. Now the other man of course was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was customary in those days at the time of the feast, time of the Passover, that they would release an individual from prison. And another could take his place or they could release one and let him go free without even another taking his place. And so they had these men here sentenced to die along with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God was sentenced to die but he'd never done anything to deserve that death. But for envy they wanted to crucify him. So they had a man there in prison by the name of Barabbas. Now Barabbas did not know what was taking place evidently. And he knew he was sentenced to die and he knew he would be dying very shortly. He knew that. He had the sentence of death upon him. And yet we find that they had decided that they would let Barabbas go free and crucify Jesus Christ the Son of God in his place. Now there's several things I want to say about Barabbas. Number one, we find Barabbas was a robber. In John chapter 18 and verse 40, now Barabbas was a robber. The Bible said that he was a man that would go out with others and rob people. You have a lot of that taking place today and this man was a robber. You have even people in the family of God that are robbers according to the Bible. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, God asked the question, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? in tithes and offerings. Now men rob God from the use of their natural ability, from the use of their talents, and from the use of their tithes and offerings in the work of God. The nation of Israel robbed God. They refused to do what God said for them to do. That is to give a tenth of their income into the work of God plus their offerings. And God Almighty penalized them for robbing Him. And God said when a person fails to give at least one-tenth of his income into the work of God, he's classified as one that robbed God. Now we know robbing is a bad thing, to go out and rob somebody, to go out and break into someone's home or break into their automobile or to break into their business and steal what they have and destroy what they have and to rob people out on the streets in various places. It's bad. We hate a thing like that. And yet the Bible said there's some in God's family that are saved that rob, that is they fail to give God a tenth of their income and God doesn't like that. God is displeased with that. God will bless any Christian that abides by the word of God and ties his income into God's work. God will see to it that you will gain by it, that you'll come out far better, that you'll lay up treasures in heaven and then God will take care of you and your business as you look after his. Barabbas was a robber. And then secondly, Barabbas was a rebel. He was one that had rebelled against the government in his day. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 7, And there was one named Barabbas which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him. 
that he rebelled against authority. He rebelled against the law of the land. He rebelled against their government. Not only was he a robber, but he was a rebel. Now we find even men today rebelling against God. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. We'll not go the old-fashioned way. We'll not go the biblical way. We'll not walk in that way. They said they rebel against God. In John chapter 5 and verse 40, the Bible says, You will not come unto me that you might have life. In Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 10, the Bible said, But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. It's always a sad and bad thing to rebel against God Ah, uh, guess what God says in this book? In Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, Simon Peter said to those people, You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your father did, so do ye. They rebelled, they resisted the Spirit of God and the things of God. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible said, One time you walked disobedient. And so this man rebelled against God. He was rebellious, he was a rebel. Not only that, but number three, Barabbas was a murderer. Now in Mark chapter 15 and verse 7, there was one named Barabbas who had committed murder in the insurrection. Here is a man that committed cold-blooded murder. Now the Bible tells us the penalty for murder. And it breaks my heart today because the state of Georgia don't have backbone enough to do what God says in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. That's one place in the Bible. God tells you that capital punishment is scriptural. And if a man deliberately goes out and murders another person, then his life should be taken. But we have a silly situation in our land today where they play these things up and play them down and play them in and out of court. And, and of course, for that reason, a lot of innocent people are dying. I was reading the paper the other day, what happened in Atlanta, where some man, uh, some person let him in, he's driving, a, I believe, a van, and, and some man kindly let him into, uh, uh, in front of him, and maybe in front of another couple in an automobile, and something happened there, and they began to fuss there in their automobiles. And then the two men in the automobile jumped out to go and attack the man, I believe the, the paper said in the van, and the man took off running and they ran him down and caught him in a cemetery. And it was the man and his son that did the chasing. They caught this man in the cemetery and threw him down and one man held him while the other stabbed him to death. Now isn't that something? That's a terrible thing. You, I'll tell you as you read something like that it just bothers you to think how stupid. Now there's a man's life taken, evidently a young man. There's a man and his son in jail for murder. All over nothing. We're living in a very fractious age and people are demonized and on dope and liquor. And that kind of stuff is taking place all over the land. Now you know as well as I, if our government, if we had a judicial system in the land today that was worth two cents, there could be a stop put to a lot of that. If a man knew within 30 days he'd be sent to the lecture chair for murder, he'd think twice before he took somebody's life. Now that man and his son knew that they probably won't do anything much with him, put him in jail and play around with the thing. And even if they sentence him to death, they never put him there. They know all of that. These criminals know that. And that's why they go out and kill innocent people. We have a rotten, stinking judicial system in the land today that stinks to high heaven. We have many, many crooked judges and crooked lawyers and spineless juries that turn criminals loose to go around and commit, to commit murder again and again and again it's wrong and it should be corrected and I'm afraid it's getting worse all the time and Barabbas was a murderer he was rightly sentenced to die but they turned him loose and crucified Jesus Christ in his place now the Son of God had never committed a sin never done anything wrong and here we have a murderer doing what our uh, crim criminal so-called justice system is doing today turning criminals loose and the Bible said they turned him loose and they took a man, even God himself, the Son of God, 
that never done anything wrong and there they put Jesus to death in the place of Judas. Now we are guilty of the death of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 53 verses 5 and 6, but he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, and all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone in his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So our sins have been laid on the Son of God, and it's our sins that drove him to Calvary. It was our sins that brought about his death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, the Bible says Christ died for our sins. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says, Who gave himself for our sins. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, Him, being delivered by the eternity counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And so you see the Son of God was crucified, He was slain, He was put to death for our sins. But rather should have been the man hanging on that middle cross. But they let him go free. They turned him loose. He was a robber. He rebelled against the government. And he was a cold-blooded murderer. And they turned him loose and let him go free. And crucified the greatest man that's ever walked on this earth in his place. Barabbas was also a prisoner. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 7. And there was one named Barabbas which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him. It's a bad thing to be in prison, I know that. I know there's men in prison today that maybe should be let loose and only committed minor crimes. And there's men that's walking the streets today that ought to be in prison. I can't understand why that some people commit some crimes, spend their entire life in prison when it's not murder, and yet cold-blooded murderers that God said ought to be put to death walk around free after a few years getting ready to kill somebody else. Now, if you can figure that one out, uh, you can beat me. I can't. The only thing I know is it's the devil. That's all I can say. It's the power of Satan working on the minds of people. Barabbas was a prisoner. Every sinner, in a sense, is a prisoner. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 17, that made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, and opened not the house of his prisoners. The devil holds all sinners captive, and they're in prison in a sense, every lost man is captured by the devil, bound by the devil, and imprisoned by the devil in this world and doesn't realize it. The devil has him in prison, a captive by sin and by evil. Every sinner is a slave to sin. Every sinner has a hard taskmaster. And your taskmaster is the devil, and he's a hard master to satisfy and to serve. He'll most certainly give you a lot of trouble, get you into a lot of trouble, give you a lot of heartaches, and cause you to suffer and then send your soul to hell. We come to the fifth thing about Barabbas, and that is Barabbas deserved to die. There's no doubt about that. Here is a man that committed these crimes and he deserved to die, especially because of the one for murder. Because the Bible says so in Genesis 9, 6 and other places in the Bible. Barabbas deserved to die. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth it shall die. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 19, Now we know that what things have the law saith, it saith them that are under the law. Every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6 says, Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Now we're all sinners we are born in this world, sinners, and the Bible said the soul that sinners is going to die that second death. Now, the only way you're going to escape that is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, we do know Barabbas deserved to die physically, no doubt about it. The law said so, the word of God said so, and then the law said so, and God said so before he gave the law. There was a man on death's row, and yet he was set free, and an innocent man died in his place. Barabbas deserved the death. Now, can you imagine how he felt when they came to him and said, Now, Barabbas, we have some good news for you today. We're going to turn you loose and somebody else will be crucified in your place. Can you imagine how that man felt? No doubt when he said, Well, who's going to, who's going to die in my place? And they said, uh, You ever hear about that man, Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, Jesus from around the Sea of Galilee and the little town of Nazareth? 
Have you ever heard about him, the man that goes about doing good, healing the sick, raising the dead? Uh, you ever hear about Oh, yes, I've heard about that man, before his miracles. Yes, I know that man. I've heard about him. Well, they said, Barabbas, he is going to take your place and die on your cross. You deserve to die, but you're set free because he will die in your place. Can you imagine how Barabbas felt? There he was, committed crime, sitting there, said, well, maybe just a matter of weeks, matter of days, matter of hours now, till I'll be crucified. Now to die on a cross in the uh, form of crucifixion is one of those horrible ways to die. And Barabbas sat there, and he thought about, well, one of these days I must die that terrible death of crucifixion. Hang there with outstretched hands, nails in my hands and my feet, then the hot sun and die that awful death. And he thought about it, well, it's just a matter of hours now. And then they'll be nailing me to that cross. And then all of a sudden he gets the good news that someone is going to die in his place. And I want you to notice in this sixth place, Barabbas, deliverance depended upon a substitute. In order for him to be released, somebody must die in his place. Now the Bible said the soul that sinneth it shall die the second death. That is, he's going to hell. The soul that sinneth is going to hell. The man that dies without Jesus Christ is going to hell. He sinneth to die that second death. Now the only way he can escape that is for another to take his place and die in his stead and pay his sin debt that through accepting him he can escape going to hell and die in the second death. Now that's exactly what Jesus did for you. That's exactly what he did for me. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 through 17, Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then, then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. He was notable. They knew he was a roughneck and a gangster. He was called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom would ye that I release unto you? Barabbas and Jesus, which is called Christ. In verse 20, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. It was the religious leaders that insisted that there they crucify Jesus, destroy him, and let the rabbi, Barabbas go free. And so another had to die in his place. Then we come to the next thought, and that is, every sinner is condemned, lost, and deserves hell. But somebody made it possible that we won't have to go there. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. See, Jesus died for you, he died for me, he died for every man. Now, if we go on and reject his salvation, fail to get saved, fail to accept him, then you're going to hell and pay for your sins in hell. But if you'll accept Jesus Christ, then those sins have been paid for in him because he paid for them when he died. For you can be set free and escape the second death and go to heaven when you die. Jesus paid the sin debt. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, the Bible said, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Jesus himself bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we won't have to go to hell. But just as certain as you listen to me today, if you die without Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. And you'll die the second death. But if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, your sins are blotted out, and you can go to heaven. Now Jesus Christ can set you free. You may say, now preacher, I'm greatly entangled up in the sins and affairs of this life. Can he set me free? He surely can. In John chapter 8 and verse 34 and 36, verses 34 and 36, Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. God will clean your record. God will clean you from every sin, forgive you, pardon you, of every sin you've ever committed from the time you came to this world to the moment you're saved. God will blot them all out. Jesus paid for every one of them. And if you'll come to Jesus Christ and set you free from those sins, Put the Holy Spirit in you and guide you along life's journey and carry you to heaven when you die. But you go without God and die in your sins, you go into hell and you go into suffering hell and also the lake of fire 
for those sins you've committed. You have rejected the Savior and refused to accept the substitute and what he did in paying your sin debt. Many years ago in the hills of West Virginia, there was a little school up there. And they had some boys in that school that were very mean and came from uh, wretched homes. And they just couldn't keep a teacher there. The boys would curse and jump on the teachers and beat them up. And they just couldn't keep a teacher there in this school. One day in seeking for a teacher, they found a young man. They told him about the situation. They asked him, they said, sir, would you go and try this school? They, those boys need a teacher. But they just can't keep one there. They run them off. He said, I'll try. They said, it's going to be tough. But he said, well, I think I can handle it. And this young teacher went to this school. He gathered these boys in. He said, now boys, I come here to be your teacher. They all laughed and giggled, made light of what he said. But he said, now listen, fellas, if we're going to have a school here, we must have some rules and regulations to abide by. And I'd like for us to set up some rules and abide by. And so the boys became quiet. They said, uh, oh, yes, they agreed with him. He said, boys, I'm going to let you set the rules. They liked that. He was really reaching them and getting to their hearts. He said, all right, boys, let's set up some rules. One boy said, well, one rule is thou shall not steal. All right, put that one on the board. He wrote it on the board. Another boy said, well, let's have another rule that thou shall not uh, fight. All right, put that one on the board. Well, let's have another rule that thou shall not uh, lay out of school. And he put that one on the board. Let's have another rule, the boy said, that we can't be late for class. It must be on time. They put that one on the rule, on the board, rather. And finally, they had several rules on the board. All right, the teacher said, is that all? They said, well, we think that would take care of the situation. We ought to be able to have a school here by abiding with these rules. All right, the teacher said, now you have the rules. You see them, you're on the board. They'll remain there. Now we've got to have some kind of punishment. Just in case someone breaks the rules, we need some kind of punishment, some form of punishment whereby to be punished. Does somebody have a suggestion? One boy stood up and said, Sir, I, I make this suggestion that if any man breaks the rules, any boy breaks one of these rules, that his coat is to be lifted from his back, he should lay across the table, and ten strong lashes is to be placed on his back. They said, Yes, we all agree. All of them agreed that was to be done. If any man broke one, any boy broke one of those rules, he would take his coat from his body, lay across the table, and then strong lashes with a whip should come across his back. That was in full agreement with every one of them. Teacher said, that's fine. That's your punishment. We'll abide by it. A few days rolled by. Everything went along well. Until one day, Big Jim came up, his lunch missing. And uh, he came in to teach. He said, teach him my lunch is missed. Somebody stole my lunch. And so they searched around, and sure enough, they found a little boy by the name of Tom had stole Big Jim's lunch. And he was guilty of stealing. And so they brought him before the group, and they said, little Tom, are you guilty of stealing Big Jim's lunch? He said, yes, sir. They said, all right, now, little Tom, why don't you take off that big coat you have on? He said, uh, uh, would you whip me with my coat on? The teacher said, no, you got to take it off. That's the rule that your coat must come off. He said, please uh, whip me with my coat on. I, I don't want to pull my coat off. And, and the teacher said, no, the rule is you must be whipped with ten lashes across your back with your coat off. You stole uh, Jim's lunch. Jim was a big old strong boy. Tom was just a little Weasley fella. And with tears in his eyes, little Tom took his coat off. When he did, he had no shirt on. He only had some uh, strings to hold up his trousers. The rest of his body was naked from his waist up. The teacher said, Tom, uh, where's your shirt? He said, uh, I don't have one. Said, Daddy died and Mama's poor. So I only have one shirt and I had to leave it at home today and for Mama to wash it and said, my brother let me wear his coat today. There he stood trembling, little fella, Weasley, naked from his waist up except the little stripes across his shoulders to uh, hold up his trousers. Big Jim stood back there, the boy whose lunch he'd stolen. Tears came into his eyes. He said, teacher, could I do something? The teacher said, uh, yes, you may, Jim. What do you want to do? He said, sir, would you let me take uh, little Tom's place and whip me for, uh, instead of little Tom, 
I know he stole my lunch, but I can't stand to see you whip that boy like that. And Big Jim said, all right, if it's all right with the class. Uh, the teacher said, all right, uh, uh, Big Jim, if it's all right with the class, we'll whip you instead of Tom. And they agreed. And Big Jim came forward and pulled his coat off and lay down across the table and took ten strong lashes across his back in the place of little Tom. When he got up to his feet, little Tom, trembling, ran to him and tears running down his face. He put his arms around Big Jim. He said, Big Jim, I'm so sorry I stole your lunch. I hadn't had anything to eat in two days, and I was so hungry when I saw it, I couldn't resist it, and I took it and ate. I'm so sorry, Big Jim. And he said, uh, I want you to forgive me. And he said, Big Jim, I want you to know I love you forever for taking this beating for me today. Now, dear people, that's what Jesus did for you. He took the beating on the cross. He was whipped. He was spit on. His beard was plucked from his face. They beat him until he didn't look like a human being. But Jesus took our place on the cross. We are the guilty ones, not him. But he took our place and died in our place instead. And if you reject Jesus and die without God, hell will be your destination. He loves you. He wants you to be saved. And if you're not saved, you can be saved today. Let's stand to our feet. Father, I pray that you'll take the message and use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. Thank you, Father, that Jesus took our place on Calvary. We'll love him forever for taking our place. But God, there's some in this building today that haven't received Christ as their Savior. No doubt there's some backslidden. No doubt there's some that needs a church home. I pray, O oh Spirit of God, move upon these hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, as Debbie plays on the instrument in just a moment, we're going to give you a chance to come forward and get saved if you're not saved. I'm not asking you to come and join the church unless you want to. I'm asking you to come and get saved. If you're backslidden, you may come back to God. If you want to join the church, you may come. If any reason God is speaking to you, you may come. And while Debbie now plays, if you'd like to come forward, would you come? Would you come and get saved today? Would you come back to God today? Would you come and join the church today? How about it? You know whether or not God is speaking to you. If you should die in the next 30 minutes, would you go to heaven or hell? If you've never been saved, you go to hell. You know that. Jesus took your place. Like Big Jim took the place of little Tom, Jesus took your place and died for you and suffered for you that you might be saved. Would you come? You won't find a better time today to get saved. You won't find a better time to come back to God. You won't find a better time to join the church if God is speaking to your heart. Would you come while we wait? Come on, these are serious moments. These are moments that you ought to do something about your soul. Would you come while we wait? Come right on while we wait. God is speaking to your heart. How about it? Would you come? While we wait, would you come? Anyone else while I wait just a moment is God speaking? This is your opportune time to obey the Spirit of God. You alone know whether or not God is speaking. God's not going to force anybody to get saved. God loves you. He wants you to come and be saved. He'll not force you to be saved. He'll let you die and go to hell. That's your choice. It's not his will that he should pray, but all should come repentance. Just another moment, we're going, but I feel like somebody, somebody God is speaking to. Someone needs to obey God.